Well, hello and welcome to Office Hours. Uh, it's a show dedicated to answering your questions about media and virtual production. We have a fine group of panelists here, so please put your questions into Makana. If you need to know where to sign up, our website is officehours.global. Um, typically, we have a second hour of interest, and on Saturdays, we've reintroduced our education hour. So Dave Trotman is here, and he's here to talk about the project approach. So please stay uh, with us after our first hour. We'll make a transition, and then we'll get into our education speech. Speech. Um, it'll be a question and answer. Believe me, there will be engagement. So, um, Mitchell, what do we have? Thank you, Josh. Our first question in from Paul Valhus in Austin, Texas. How do you use NDI virtual input with Shoot to allow an iPhone feed without requiring a USB cable? Shandy has done this. I'm not sure who that is. And Alex? You know, I don't know how this one works specifically. In the past, what happens is, is it shows up as an NDI source for, we've done it with other NDI tools on the phone, and it shows up as an NDI source for the app that's looking for it. They'll see each other, they'll find each other on the network. So uh, I don't think that there's any reason that it needs to be plugged in. I've definitely used NDI from, um, I believe the the new tech tools that are on the on the iPhone, and it just shows up immediately as a source for Mimo Live, which is what I tested it on. So it should work some in a similar fashion of telling it to be an NDI source, and then being able to find it on a on an external computer. Yeah, and Paul, you should be able to find that once it's communicating properly. Uh, we had a play with it uh, yesterday and after hours, and make sure that if you've purchased it, you need the full version to have the NDI access for the shoot tool. Uh, make sure that you select the NDI, NDI on features. There's an off, there's 720p, 1080p, and they have a 4K mode as well. That'll start sending your um, NDI out to the network. And then you wanna make sure if you wanna use it as a virtual input, the webcam function, and NDI should be able to help you out there. Uh, let's go to our next question. And it's from Simon Ray and Shrewsbury, UK. I've seen some good colorizations and enhancements of 100-year-old footage. Can the panel recommend any AI services for upscaling and enhancing footage shot in the 80s on a VHS camcorder? A friend's wedding anniversary is not far away. Alex? Yeah, I, I, the one that I found that I that I have seen other products from that have worked pretty well are PixBim, a P I X B I M. Um, they have a colorization, but they also have a lot of other things: object removal, animate photos, those types of things. I don't know how I haven't used it personally, so I don't know how well it would work. But it would be great to have them on for a second hour, Josh. I'm just saying, it'd be we should PixBim, P I X B I M. Just saying. How do I get in touch with them? Do I PixBim? <laughs> ah, Mitchell. And strangely enough, uh, in the continuing world of uh, plugins being available, uh, you can take perfectly good footage now and make it look like VHS or bad colorizations. So, yeah, we've been able to do that for years. Uh, see, it's, nice, it's nice to do it, just uh, <laughs> downgrading. Yeah, you get your purist out there. They want the real fuzz. Let's go to our next question. Next question is for me. Uh, take a look at Angry Audio's new C4 audio processor. It's designed to gently ride gain to the office hours minus 24 LUFS standard. Comments? Oh, not seeing that. I see you have the link there, Mitchell. Uh, you want to elaborate? Yeah, I've been uh, over the link. Uh, it's uh, our good friend Catfish over at Angry Audio, which makes great little tools. And what they've come up with is... Um, a processor. In fact, they've got like three flavors of it. Um, this one in particular is just there for gain writing. So if you have a uh, processor or a satellite uh, or even a YouTube audio, it rides it very carefully. It's not, uh, you can't really hear it working. It's multiband. So it's doing it separately on the highs, mids, and lows. Um, and I just, uh, it just caught my attention when I saw minus 24 because that's our preferred uh, level. So it's a simple box that you just plug your headphones into and you can monitor away or let it uh, run uh, run your master audio at a uh, at a very nice level. I have not personally heard it, but um, uh, Courtney Gould, I think is his name, uh, is the architect. And he used to be over at Telos and he's one of the guys that did the Omnia 9. So um, it's good stuff. Okay, Is that uh, meant to be the last step in your audio chain, Mitchell? No, I would put it before your audio chain. Um, what it does is uh, some of us are better than others at writing gain from the, the board out into the uh, the processing. 
Um, when I used to be a DJ, uh, the engineer used to come in and uh, say, uh, do you hear that ticking sound? I'm like, what ticking sound? He said, that ticking sound. Um, it was the the level meters on the console smacking the opposite side. He said, you don't pay much attention to your levels. So the point I'm making is that uh, this device would go in between the uh, the output of the radio station or streamer uh, and into any processing, if if any, uh, just to keep a consistent volume level. It's almost as if somebody is there just riding, casually routing the level instead of it being a hard compressor. Okay, got you. So that is something that can keep a consistent level, and then you would put your target level output afterwards. Yep. Did I get yeah, that puts right? It in the, puts it in the sweet spot. Okay, sounds good. Now we'll have to see if anyone gets a hold of that. We can check it out in after hours. Let's go to our next question. Uh, Juan C. Robles in uh, Mexico City. Any one of our radio guys had he uh, heard or worked with liquid soap? Alex? I have to admit, I haven't seen it before this, but it looks really interesting. It, this is so what liquid soap looks to be is a um, basically a language or, a you know, kind of a, a, a programming library that will allow you to it's for just for streaming audio and video. So uh, it allows you to define your streams and, and build them out. I, I, I don't have any experience with it, but just digging through it cursatory be, before we got to this question. It's yet another thing that might be kind of fun to bring on for a second hour because it, uh, it does look like a really interesting technology. I need a secretary. Uh, let's go, Mark. Yes, exactly. <laughs> I don't have any experience with it either. Thank you, Mark. Appreciate that. Next question. Ari Block from Tel Aviv, Israel. In your opinion, is linear broadcasting and pre-scheduled content going to slowly die and give way to on-demand-only content, with the exception of sports news and coverage of physical on-premise events? All right. Well, we needed this. We needed a little philosophical discussion. Let's start with Nigel and then perhaps John. You like to weigh in. I guess my only point is, why is it slowly dying? It seems to be accelerating into death very fast. Um, I, I, I don't watch any linear television anymore. Um, even catching up with the uh, royal stuff in the UK, I watched it on YouTube. I thought BBC did a great job putting it up there. Um, you know, when I used to work, I used to work in local radio in England. And we used to joke that local radio was something to do between the news. And I suspect that's sort of where linear television is going to. It's something to do between uh, the news or between live sports. So I actually think it's, it's accelerating. I think the quality of programs is encouraging that, uh, both on the streaming side and on the broadcast side. Well, John, so far your options are fading or death spiral. I'll play the devil's advocate. I think there's always going to be a job to be done for people to push one button and have something play for them without any judgment, just that background noise. So I suspect there will be some amount of linear programming for a long time to come. Alex? I think I think that John is right and, and Nigel's right. <laughs> so, so I think that uh, I think that there's there's going to be more and more where you want to, like we're moving somewhere in the future to where you could turn, I mean, after hours in some ways is the case, but office hours will eventually grow if we're successful into something that is, you know, 24 seven, you can just turn it on and just listen to a show, you know, and not, not necessarily after hours, but like literally just listen to different subjects being t covered in a certain vertical. And, and so I think that that idea of, I just want to turn it on. I, I want to turn it on and listen to, you know, geeky things about media. I'm going to turn that on right now. That doesn't exist. The reason it doesn't exist is because it was really expensive to do that in the past, but with YouTube and many other things, it's just not now. And what was then hard was how do we get everybody into a studio? And that's one of the things that we're fixing here. So as we get better at us using zoom ISO and building up these shows and figuring out how to do those, we're basically building a global studio that can then feed into a live stream you know and so i think i don't think that we're the answer but we're pointing towards it you know and i think that uh you know you could this this could be about it could be about everything it could be about nascar it could be about uh, f1 it could be about basketball it could be about gardening it could be about knitting whatever those things are that people want to listen to it could be you know all of those are individual verticals that people would want to to john's point just turn on the dial and know that it's just going to play something that's kind of interesting and what you want. If you want something different, different subject, you just change the subject. Um, I think that the, I think what people are getting less and less interested in is um, just lots of different things coming through. Some people want that, but a lot of times, you know, the, uh, like as someone who listened to NPR for a long time, you always knew in the last 15 minutes, it was just going to be kind of 
dead. Like like they're gonna they're gonna. This is all the goofy stories that they they just have, they just like pile all the trash into the into the last last fifty minutes of the show, and um and so you know it's all useful until about thirty five to forty after, and then after that it's just what you're like why oh, who who thought that this was gonna be a good idea, and so and so the um. Uh, so, so I think that, uh, that was, that hurt it because it's not something I wanted to listen to all day, you know, because you, you had these interruptions of, of uselessness. So, so the, um, I think that, uh, I do think that regular programming for broadcast, the problem is their infrastructure is too expensive. What we're doing here is light and fast. Um, and we can now suddenly we're pushing the envelope of proving what, what the quality can be, which I will argue is oftentimes higher than what we see on broadcast. Um, and uh, the problem is for the traditional linear channels, not so much linear playback, but linear channels. I think they're going to have a hard time because they have a lot of infrastructure and a lot of uh, um, you know, technical debt that they can't, that they're not going to be able to pay off. And so, so I think that, that there's a, that that's coming. I also think that uh, as Nigel pointed out, I don't watch any I mean, I, the only the only time I turn on television, I, I have YouTube TV, but I use it. The reason I have YouTube TV is so that I can collect graphics data. You know, like what are people using for graphics, and what are people doing this, and I can go back and see some clip that I wanted because I record everything. Like on YouTube TV, I have like hundreds of records going on all the time, and so I just if I want if I heard something happened, I can just go back and grab that. But I don't actually turn it on and watch it very often. I mean, definitely not live except for the Steelers. Yeah, and that's kind of the thing that hurts the automatic broadcast uh because you're 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 in it and you're locked in and they're going to feed you kind of what, whatever that pipe is is delivering you'll be at the end of it receiving it without any 1x or well, well i or think that i think speed. that again what i'm hoping to yeah i mean but i with these discussions especially when they're interactive you don't want to listen to it you don't i, I don't know how many people would they, they might listen to this show but if you're in if you're interacting with the content then you're more likely, like if you're asking questions or chatting about it, then it going fast isn't as important because it's part of the experience. And so I think that, you know, finding, you know, that's where McConaughey kind of comes in where it's it's useful to have the audience, some of the audience, 10% of the audience engaged in the conversation itself. So is linear broadcasting, maybe uh, thinking about Ari's question here, is it just that it's, you know, lot, single live content or is it that it's, um, what am I trying to say? It, is it that so the interactive bit would be something that wouldn't be just pre-programmed and pushed onto a channel out and, and, and some use. channels do this i mean some channels do interactive yeah. send us your tweets send us your da, 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 but it's just very um ham-fisted <laughs> you know so uh yeah i mean right. radio radio has survived as as mark was kind of alluding to with a little hand signal uh radio has survived on phone calls for a long time <laughs> you know i mean there's a whole talk shows that they're just surviving I mean, that's part of the model that we have here is really after what me driving listening to michael krasny and people calling in and thinking about how I could hopefully do it better, not better than Michael, but better than having people actually call in because, you know, I, I kind of uh, view listening to people ask questions to be difficult, you know, so, um, so that, you know, it's just that I, I don't really, people aren't very good at asking questions if they haven't done it a bit. Yeah. And, and I would say that um, the, the consumption or the distribution determine the consumption when people were broadcasting out with limited bands that you tuned into that channel and whatever was on that channel, that's what you heard, whether they decide to engage the audience or not. Um, I could see both points because on the one hand, it's probably going to be a limited market that actually want that to be programmed to, but then again, it's not as difficult of a lift to distribute it. You know, it's not the same bandwidth. They'll reallocate the yeah, the I, frequencies I, I, out there. I think there, the but. thing that the opportunity with live streaming and the mixed with what we're doing here on Zoom is that anybody can build a vertical, a, a very vertical model. So like they don't, and yep. that's that should terrify broadcasters because you know there we've been all willing to to watch and listen to Gruel that was good enough for all of us to kind of like, but if we get into the stuff that where we have things that we really like. Mm -hmm. And that is the thing that we're passionate about. And that's, you know, so whether, whether that might be French cooking or, or, um, uh, or, you know, it could get, you know, it's not just cooking. It could get to be French cooking or Cambodian cooking or, or making sushi. It, it could sure. also be growing, you know, certain kinds of 
flowers. And, and as that, as that proliferates, what you end up with is just lots and lots of verticals and people only listening to things that they're really passionate about. And I think it changes their listening. They're going to be more interested. Um, they're going to be more, you know, excited about that, about that process. And they're going to be more interactive and they don't, they won't be interactive all the time. We have, I think a lot of people with, with office hours that listen most of the time and every once in a while, I got a question, you know, and, and knowing that they can ask that question pulls them into that conversation. It's the, there's a little bit of a, it's not that you uh, always do something, but knowing that you can makes you more engaged. It brings you into a more active listening um, mentality than a passive one. Yeah, I, I can definitely see that. So just the fact that um, you can have those unique verticals, um, that means that and anybody out of their, uh, you know, it's funny. I remember the old Bill and Ted's thing that like they had a cable channel in their basement because, of course, you know, nobody yeah. nobody took well, not, it, took it, it seriously. Exactly, and well, and 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 the thing that we're hoping to do with office hours is we figure this out. You know, we haven't figured it out. Like we're figuring it out. We're figuring out how to do it. We're figuring out how to, now how to make it simpler, how to make it easier. And I think that the seeds of a lot of these channels may come out of the people who are watching office hours or participating where they go, okay, I have like Lois ha is interested in, in, in birding. And so we have that, uh, Tony's interested in conversation. And so we have that, but I think you'll see more of those as we get better and as we refine it and, and hopefully train more people and have more people see that, that we can start building this higher level um, production you know, for, for things that each one of us are interested in, you know, and so, and some of it might be media and video re related. Well, office hours will do a lot of that, but it could be uh, all kinds of other, other subjects. So there's, you know, tens of thousands of subjects. And at that point, what happens for linear broadcasting is they really need hundreds of thousands or millions of viewers. And if, if it all dissipates or diffuses into many, many verticals, they won't know how to, how to manage that. Yeah, I agree. So that before they had one pipe and they had to figure out, you know, by taking polls or whatever, what's the best thing, best bang for our, our broadcasting? Ratings. They reach. didn't take polls. They just took ratings. Nielsen. <laughs> that, that's how they figured out. That's how the Nielsen, is, the Nielsen ratings is how they figured out what was working and not working. They throw a bunch of shows, you know, back in the old days, they'd throw a bunch of shows out. Um, do they, They'd sign a pilot or they'd sign, you know, the first six you know, the first season or the first six episodes and they'd watch how it, how it tracked. And if it didn't track, they'd cancel it, you know, and they'd go, okay, well that didn't work. And then that would go, but that would affect years of planning because they would just go that, that type of thing doesn't work, you know, and then they'd go on to something else. And it was easier when they only had three, three networks. They didn't cancel a lot because they didn't have a lot of competition. Cancellations happen a lot faster when you, when you have to, uh, you know, uh, move a lot faster because there's so much more competition. So as cable built up, they had to do a lot, a lot more moving. And now it's just getting, it's getting to be super, super diffuse. And again, it's, I think we're about to move because there was still, you know, it was a very heavy, I worked in a very small network, uh, prime sports network, which became Fox sports um, in the early nineties. And for a tiny little channel that you didn't even know was on your, di you know, <laughs> for the most part in the United States, there's a huge infrastructure, you know, there's like 50 people working there and there's, you know, big expenses and there's, you know, every, every Nuggets game was $55,000 to do, you know, and, and it was, you know, there was a, there was a whole thing that, that it took. And now we're getting down to a point where we can have these conversations for a fraction of that cost. And that's where, you know, again, whether, no matter what people are interested in, there's an opportunity to build a show about it. And what I'm committed to is that everyone has the tools to do that at a relatively, not free, but relatively inexpensive way to do to have a high quality experience at a fraction of the cost. And that that's a, uh, it's disruptive. I would argue and that low barrier to entry makes it interesting to see what types of things people will try because they can, and, it's accessible. Well, and the thing is, is that it's, it's all about, it's, it's about them doing it well. Like a lot of people are going to do it. <laughs> the key is what we're hoping to do is, is try to build the best practices within office hours to have people be able to learn how to do it well you know, and, and do it at the level that we're doing it now and then better than us over time and us be better than us <laughs> over time. And so, I mean, if I, 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 um, for our, I'm not going to, I'm, I'm not going to unveil it until, uh, the, I'm not going to unveil it until the thousandth episode, but I do have the 325 episode. <laughs> so it, 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 it's kind of stunning to see how far we've come 
uh, nice. from from 325 to you know over a thousand episodes so it's it's pretty exciting so so the key is if we keep on evolving and we keep on sharing what we're doing that's why we're totally transparent about how we do these productions is it's not about us doing it, it's about everyone doing it. it's almost like the moore's law of broadcasting now because now you have the acceleration you're not you don't have yeah. one channel or a couple channels you've got all these different avenues that can parallel you know yeah. pipe this stuff up uh tony you want to weigh in I, I, I'm not sure what to say after all of that. That was, that was great content. Um, but but I, I did want to say that I think um, my family might be typical of what is going on right now. And by that, I mean that we have um, satellite service and we are not watching it. And one of the things that's that's curious to me about it is that we also have, <clears throat> excuse me, quite a bit of the streaming services and we are targeting the content that we like. The only reason that I still have the satellite is because my wife, who is a connoisseur of a certain type of evening soap opera type of content, um, she wants that. And, but the interesting thing about it is she does not watch it live. She's a consumer of it. Um, she'll, she'll watch uh, content episode after episode, episode after, you know, to co continuously watching episodes one after the other. Mm -hmm. Serial watching. Mm -hmm. Serial watching. And it's then a nice she way to say binge not, watching. Yes. Well, it is. It really is binge watching because <laughs> that's the way in which she consumes the content. But what I want to say is that it is it is I don't think it's unique in that most people are. Ready for the content that Alex has proposing, they just don't know that they're ready for it yet. So right now they are consuming it through TikTok and, and Instagram and Facebook and Snapchat. They are listening and watching those things that are important to them or a distraction for them. And you, so, it, yeah, I, I think that we are already there. It's just that the hammer hasn't dropped. Like in my case, I had the satellite service because they make it extremely easy for me to continue it even though we are not watching it. Oh yeah, they and want to sell you advertisements. Yeah. And then the other piece is they they package it with my great internet service. So because my fiber is connected to the satellite service, they make it attractive to keep it even though we are not utilizing it at all. Yeah, closing down that service means they no longer have a, an advertisement stream uh, to you. So they're they're um, sort of making it a, a good deal. But you make a good point, Tony, that um, even a generation that was used to consuming content in this way, once they've they've seen the other the other side is is greener, they're they're willing to to move. So uh, a large vestige of the way things used to be. But again, our uh, comment talking about the linear broadcasting means having those individual channels. Uh, Mark, do you want to weigh in? Sure. So uh, it's a great Sunday question. This could go on for hours. But on one hand, I think we're creatures of habit. I got to be shaving by seven. And by the time they go from national news to local news, I got to be in the shower and then I got to be dressed by the time we go back to segment one. So people are creatures of habit. They understand they use the radio or TV as something to play in the background to give them a sense of time. On the other hand, we love freedom. We love being able to watch something on demand when we want to watch it, when we have time. The only thing that's true for both of these is we're running out of hours in a day to consume all of this. Good point. And John? One last bold prediction. I think that within two years, one of the big streamers, in an attempt to keep people from uh, turning off sub their subscriptions, will try a live viewing party with some sort of audience interaction. And so we'll have the same thing in a different format from a different service. All right, we'll mark this and come back to your prognostications. Let's go to our next question. Uh, 
Oh, I think we lost Mitch. So a question is from Tony Mobley I, here on the panel. I can I can jump in. Tony you Mobley in? from Noonan, Georgia asks, is there a plan to get non-office hour members into after hours or are they strongly encouraged to participate on YouTube during regular broadcasts? And I'll, I'll, I'll jump in. <laughs> Go ahead, Alex. Um, yeah, so I... I, I I'm not worried about where people watch it right now. So if they want to watch it on YouTube, if they want to watch it in after hours, uh, I don't have a strong opinion about that. Um, they're about uh, 20 seconds ahead <laughs> in after hours than they are in, in, off, in, in the uh, YouTube stream, just as the nature of, the, of, the, of that there. I will say that over time, um, most likely the YouTube stream will be a higher quality stream. It will look nicer than the one that's going into... Uh, office hours because we're going to push it to 4k hdr and a lot of you know 5.1 and so but that's you know going to take time for us to kind of get that all working so uh, i would say it doesn't really matter right now um, but uh, over time the live stream itself will probably be better in other p platforms because it's not real time we can do all kinds of fun things when we push that but who knows i mean zoom could be giving us something in the future that makes it even better. We don't, we don't, we just don't know. So, uh, but, but I, I think right now they're both equal, like they, like they have been in the past. Yeah. As far as the, the latency, you're not going to really lose your producer edge by watching the YouTube feed over the webinar. I will say too, well, was webinar, we've moved for it. And the fact that we're moving into a breakout also means that 720p might be an issue over 1080p. So it may already be uh, a better quality uh, feed from our YouTube. Breakout. Is Breakout 720p on its own or is it just the way we feed it right now? Well, th so the issue is that when we were in the Zoom webinar, um, we could force 1080p to everyone uh, because of the distribution method that Zoom uses. But when you use a regular meeting, so whether you're in a regular meeting or in a breakout room, just like another meeting, um, Zoom does not create two HD feeds. And so whatever active speaker there is, whenever they create that smaller feed, um, a tablet or a phone will pull that down to 720 inside of a meeting mm -hmm. or a breakout room. So it's, I mean, it's close to, it's, it's good to have good pixels in. So that means if anybody to, joins from a tablet or a phone in the meeting, in the breakout room, it'll reduce us to 720. I'd say after about 25 people, you probably expect a tablet or a phone uh, to be involved. And if they're watching that feed, that feed will be given a 720p feed to the individual. It's one of the uh, courts. Not just that feed, but it affects everybody, right? It does. It is. Yeah, because that feed being generated for the, the device that needs mm -hmm. it will not be given two feeds. They won't create a 1080p feed and a 720p mm -hmm. feed. They'll just give a 1080p feed. But that might be a good uh, feature request to uh, to be able to force 1080p in meetings. It's something right. that you can do in the settings in a webinar, and we, we mm -hmm. have done it. So it's in, ensured that everyone gets the... Uh, well, you can offer the 1080p and you can force the 1080p. Those are mm -hmm. two different options as well. Right. So there's advantages to not forcing it as well. But Got it. yeah, so YouTube, uh, YouTube is, is a good option. Uh, to watch this uh, show, I'd say. Let's go, to, let's go to our next question, Alex. Uh, no, Mitch is back, I think. Are you back, Yeah, Mitch? I'm back, squirrels. You know, I, what can you do? <laughs> didn't see you uh, Andy in. Carluccio from San Francisco uh, asked, Zoomtopia is coming up soon. I know some folks in the Office Hours community will be attending in person. What do you have to learn more about during the conference, either in San Jose or remotely? John, are you coming in remotely or in person? No, I, I'm. We have a rocket launch in October, so I can't go to that. But we're super excited to have Andy release the new 360 degree view of Zoom, so that we can play that back in our rocket. Andy, are you working on that feature for us? <laughs> <laughs> we need the ability. We're putting the 360 degree camera inside the rocket, and with YouTube, we can get the 360 degree view. And so we want to. We want to have that same feature in Zoom so people don't have to leave Zoom for the show that we plan on launching next year. You got a countdown then. T minus 360 view request. Alex? You know, it's funny that John says that because um, when we started doing live 360 for Facebook, uh, we were kind of part of that launch team. And and um, 
the we were like it'd be really good in hangouts to have a 360 view a live 360 view that people could be asking questions but then looking around like looking around at what they were doing so you imagine we didn't think of john's rocket but we mostly thought of we could go to uh you know to the pyramids or to um you know camp you know anchor watt or or something like that and be able to actually you know, have a 360 view people are wandering around and going what is that what is that and and being able to kind of explore it so it would be really interesting to see as far as zoomtopia goes obviously what we're really interested in or what i don't know all of us but what i'm really interested in is the integration you know so so broadcast tools how do we integrate the audience how do we um you know have more creative ways of getting uh, video and audio and exploration back into um, into Zoom itself. Um, so those features are are pretty important, as well as kind of event management. You know, I get to see kind of both ends of it. Uh, I you know I we have office hours and I work on stuff that is pretty managed, and my my wife works on things that are very much vanilla Zoom. You know, like she figures that all out and she runs very intricate shows. And so I think finding how both of those audiences are served by what Zoom's doing, I think will be really interesting, but obviously most of our interest is going to wrap around um, professional inter integration uh, or, or video integration with other systems. All right, let's go to our next question. Next question in from Douglas Carmichael. The Angry Audio C4 processor has audio connectors that use the Studio Hub Plus standard. What is that standard, and where can you get cabling that uses it? Mitchell? Uh, the Studio Hub standard was designed... Um, uh, by a console manufacturer in the broadcast industry. And basically, um, it's an interconnection system that uses uh, an Ethernet connector on one end, which makes it very easy to insert and then as a pinout to the normal uh, audio channels like XLR or whatever you might need. Um, the folks at Angry Audio now own that, uh, that trademark and they utilize it in their products. So what, you, what you'll see on the back of a uh, Studio Hub Plus system is a XLR connector, or excuse me, a uh, an Ethernet connector, and that in turn provides audio pinout for whatever other devices on the chain. It makes it a lot easier if you're in a broadcast environment because it used to be that we had every single connector in the uh, audio chain go to a uh, an old 66 uh, telephone hub and you had to punch it down and that that went to the next thing or went back to engineering. Nowadays, everything is very civilized with uh, Ethernet connectors. So it's a standard, and you can get it if you want it uh, at the uh, Angry Audio site where Catfish is and that C4 lives. Um, there's all kinds of different connectors and pinouts and systems uh, that use the Studio Hub standard. All right. Thanks for that, Mitchell. Let's go to our next question. Tony Mobley is back from Noonan, Georgia. I'm using the Shoot Pro app on my iPad today. Anyone using the Shoot app that way? And how many panelists got it yesterday? Tony, are you using it for your main camera? I am not. I'm using it on my iPad. My main camera is an iPhone that is in the back of the teleprompter. And I haven't figured out how to control it yet uh, we had a great conversation in after hours with Michael and he went into some detail on how I would be able to do that, but I haven't had a chance to actually do it. But I, what I can do is share what the iPad and shoot looks like through my ATEM. So this is me using it and Let's see if I can go to the Zoom feature. Oh, oh I don't want the eye. So I'm not going to try to do any real demonstrations because I don't want to discourage anybody because I think this uh -huh. is a great app. Uh, yeah, I think, but, I think a few of us got onto it. But um, I will say that I, I, I really um, kind of went out on a limb for me financially to, to get the, the lifetime. And I'm, I'm happy that I did because um, I shared it with a couple of people and it has gone up by $300. So if you guys didn't know that, 
It went we got up the, by three hundred dollars. We got the early warning. So for those did, of us, I that did. I just in, want to say I did the best I could. It's a really great app. It's and it's it's worth the money that he's charging now for it, um, which is I think about thirty five dollars a year or whatever to to get the. Um, um, but I. I also jumped in and did the upgrade because I had had the original app. And so I jumped in, did the lifetime at $35, which is $45 yesterday, now 300 and something dollars today. Um, and uh, I think 335 or something like that. Anyway. Um, no, it's 350. Oh, 350, yeah. So it's for the lifetime, but $35 for a, a year for, a, for an app that is actually, here's my complaint is when people start to do stuff and they're not actively working on it. Like there's just a subscription and I see a feature here, a feature there. Uh, what you have with Shoot is <laughs> he's, he's updating it all the time. Um, you know, there's just a lot of things, you know, you're getting updates constantly. He's constantly adding features and putting those things in. And so I think you wanna, you know, you, you don't want him to have to hold his breath between every major up re release and hope that people do it. I think that, it, I think it makes sense in his case um, to do that. I, I think it's worth it, but of course it was, it was more worth it. Um, yesterday. So we had him on on Friday. We showed you, I put it on Discord. I know I, I wanted to make sure it was clear that there's no financial connection to this. Michael Ford just happens to be in, embedded in our community. He's doing, he's been working really hard. He was very responsive. He put like Fenwick frames in and did all kinds of other stuff. And, um, and I, so I've, I've used his app and really like it. And it's a great, like kind of all purpose Swiss army knife for, for what I'm doing, for what we're doing. Um, and I wanted to make sure that no one felt like they were left out. Like, hey, why didn't you tell me <laughs> you know, that, that this deal was going on? So if you're in Discord, I put it out there just to make sure that everyone had an opportunity to, to get in before the price uh, jumped pretty, pretty, pretty big pi uh, price hike. So anyway, so hopefully he'll, yeah. he'll do well with that. We've been talking about it for a while, but it's nice to have, uh, have that on and see how receptive he is to some of the features. I'm looking forward to a lot of the features. Um, sorry, Nigel, I think we uh, crossed over you. Yeah, that's okay. Um, I too have been doing what Tony's been doing. So if I switch to that, that's my iPad. Um, and what I'm interested in is can I make uh, that work with continuity camera? So I really like continuity camera on the, the new Mac OS. It really integrates well into the various different packages. So I'm going to try and play with that. I've just not checked yet. Uh, but the thing I love about the continuity camera is when I'm in meetings, because I do these strange things called physical meetings that sometimes we virtually bring people oh, in. I heard of those. I, yeah, it's, it's, it's a bizarre thing. It's like steam trains. There's still people doing it. Do you, have to, do you, do um, you iron your shirt all the way down? I do. I do. And starch my collars. Um, but I often put my iPhone on a, on a cupboard or on a wall or somewhere so they get a good view of the room. So I'd be interested to see if I can make continuity camera work that way too. Yeah, um, I did uh, download it as well. Let me see if I can cut to it. So there's the camera and I like the feature. So I say testing, uh, you, you hold the line and it draws something and I'm testing this. This is what I'm, this is what I'm testing right here. So you just do the little draw feature and it'll listen. And depending on the line of text, it puts that on the screen. So prep things and you can pull it off. Um, really interesting. Uh, Tony, did you, um, did you have something else you wanted to show? I, I just wanted to say, I want to encourage anyone who had, who went on and got it yesterday, go ahead and play with it. It is it, amazing. And, and Michael has some pretty good, um, uh, vi tutorial videos on how to use shoot. So uh, I encourage you to play with it. I am, I am committed to getting it in the back of my teleprompter and working as um, a, a test as my primary camera. Yeah, and I think um, Michael said that he was going to tweet out when he gets the the OH bump. You know how how much of our community uh, jumped onto that. Uh, let's go to our next question. Next question in from John Foltz in Ceilings Grove, Pennsylvania. What are the best strategies for the audio chain going to Black Magic Constellation? Alex. Yeah, so it depends on what whether you're trying to actually do production, audio production in the in the um, ATEM, or or whether you're uh, trying to just embed it. So my recommendation, as much as you can, is to probably just embed it. The audio pipeline is a little funky uh, going into into um, the constellation, but there's a couple different strategies. One is you can embed audio into every SDI 
um, that you're sending into or HDMI so that each one of those is getting audio embedded into it. Now you can mix and match inside of the ATEM to make that work. It also does accept MADI for the Constellation. And so you can have, I believe, up to 64 channels of MADI that go into it. Interestingly enough, it only does two out. So it's stereo out, but but 64 in, um, which is why we kind of stopped looking at it that much because we want all the channels back out again. Um, but that, you know, so it's really designed that everything comes into it and then it just manages a stereo output. So uh, so that's that's kind of how that that works there. So you can use Maddie to deliver it or you can put it on all the individual channels. Of course, you have XLR, so you can get just stereo in. But the problem with that is usually you have a lot more channels that you're working with. So I find that the best way to do it is still put a mixer in front of it and send it in because it just doesn't give me enough controls. And like, the, for instance, it's got lots of mixing, but it, does, it doesn't have the bus structures and everything else that we would normally want for a digital mixer. Um, to do the kind of the level of work that we normally do. So there are some tools for those channels. There are some, you know, it's got some interesting mix minuses. So if you tell it which ones people are talking to each other, it'll automatically build those for you. So there are some things that you may find, but in a general purpose solution, I would recommend probably still putting something like an X32 or a QL1 or something else in front of it to do most of the heavy lifting and then hand it back off to the mixer. Uh, you can embed it. Uh, in there, but that's in, in the advantage of embedding it in the constellation is that you'll generally have uh, almost no uh, delay issues. You won't have to delay the audio because it's being embedded right where the video is. I wonder what it would take for Black Magic to offer a competitive advantage in the audio realm for one of these things. They have all the tools. I mean, they, it's just it's just a. I think that Black Magic is still a video heavy co company, and so. You know, with the Fairlight tools, they could absolutely build something that would so solve that issue. I really wish that they would break away from traditional buses. You know, I think that um, you know, they're it's very confining. <laughs> as a non, as someone who uses mixers but is not hasn't used them, you know, forever, I I really would love to get away from the bus structure and just go into a nodal, uh, like similar to what we see in the 806 but with a better interface and more more tools. What you really want, in my opinion, is, you know, I just have nodes that are inputs. I just say, this is an input, this is an input, this is an input. And then I have processors that I can go into. I have mixers that I can mix, you know, multiple versions of these into. And I have outputs and then I have uh, devices, so sliders and so on and so forth. And the idea is, is that I could just build a node structure that let me um, say these to take these MIDI devices or these devices and you just set them on. I want this, this, this slider attenuates volume you know, or it attenuates the, you know, this or that. And, and I think that building a more open architecture is something that black magic could do because they don't really, they're not wedded to the, you know, they're not, try, it's not Yamaha trying to keep everybody happy. Mm -hmm. um, black magic could do something more interesting and they, they're more software defined than most other, other folks. So I think if they came out with something like that, I think it'd be really interesting to be taking basically fusion that they already have and turning it into an audio app. <laughs> and so, uh, and so I think that that would be really exciting. And then I think that they could, and they, they'd be able to, they're one of the few companies that could probably pull that off. But I've been waiting for someone to do that for like a decade. Every time I see nodes at, at AES or something like that, I go over and then they're doing something else with it. Now, they've been able to be augmented software wise of, you know, programs like Mix Effect. But as far as the hardware goes, that's something that Blackmagic has to uh, jump on the board. And as we learned from our uh, IBC coverage interview with the question about NDI on a Blackmagic, they're listening to feedback. So yeah, we, we give them the feedback. There. <laughs> it's not going to happen. Um, so the, the, I mean, that, that's the nicest way of saying it. I'm not going to do it. Um, so the, uh, the, by the way, Binky points out that I, I'm talking, I keep on forgetting that there's other constellations other than the, the constellation constellation. Mm. So the constellation HDs don't have the Matty feature. It's just the 8K version that has that. Okay, let's go to our next question. Brody Hefner, New York City. With the advent of the ATEM switcher with SDI connectors, what use cases would justify converting a home studio from an ATEM uh, HDMI and ATEM to SDI? What additional cost would result and what long-term benefits could accrue? Mark? Well, I think a lot of it depends on what your sources are. If you have a lot of HDMI sources, then the original ATEM with the HDMI makes sense. I do know that the SDI one offers you two more additional outputs. And when you combine that with a deck link that's external to a Mac, then you can start to convert over to the SDI, um, you know, 
system. But I, I will caution you that there are different types of sonnet boxes to put these uh, Declan cards in. Some of them can power the card, which you need for the quad, uh, and other, and some of them are just too small to fit the actual quad into. So be careful when you purchase a sonic box to put that Declan card into. But I think the SDI is going to be the future. Mitchell? Yeah, I think Mark is right. Uh, you know, you have to manage all these uh, connections. And HDMI is sort of a semi-consumer level uh, product. And as you can see, if you start plugging in all of your uh, your HMI connections, uh, you have a lot of wires that you got to manage. And uh, the, I think that the best scenario is to have a rack-mounted uh, 2ME in a rack with SDI in and out. And then you can do all your rack-related wiring back and forth. The only problem is that you got to go with high-end cameras to get SDI out from them or go with a converter. So now we're talking about a lot of converters. So um, it might be that the HDMI uh, for general use uh, makes sense. Uh, but if you're if you're stepping up, uh, SDI sort of makes more sense, but it comes with a price tag. Alex? Yeah, I think that um, the big, one of the biggest advantages of SDI is routing. <laughs> like, so density and routing are the big thing. So for instance, if you're using SDI, you can get, you know, I, I finally got the right box, uh, the, the Echo Express SE1, not SEL, not that I'm bitter. Um, and so the, um, so I got the, the SEL um, or the SE1, SE1. Not the SEL. It's so they're they're, they're the same price and <laughs> literally it's just nutty. It's so, um, but I have eight SDI outputs. I can't get a card that does eight HDMI outputs, and so I've got eight SDI outputs out of uh, my Mac Mini as an example, and then that's going to go into the switcher. But the other big advantage is, is that I can use um, now. I have all the routing, and so I have I can get a twenty by twenty router and now push all those out, and then push things out to monitors and do all this stuff. It's really painful to get HDMI matrix matrices that are built for integrators and so on and so forth, not like a real tool. And so, um, so I think that it's actually, yeah, it's, it's, a, it's, it's, it's a much better situation to, um, to get the, uh, to, to have SDI. I'm, I'm happy with it at home. You know, I'm connected to the cameras, but I'm, I'm, I bought the, the SDI version and I'm pretty happy, I'm pretty excited about that because I just have a lot more routing options. Yeah, I just think of all of the conversion uh, effort that someone like Aaron Brecky has gone through for all of the HDMI to SDI conversions. Yeah. Let's go to our next question. From Chris Widener in Lafayette, Indiana. Has anyone tried the Starlink backpacks yet? Starlink backpacks. Do yeah, those I, think that they've, I think they've made an propulsion. An yeah, exactly. I know. I just think that they're, I think that these are the new ones that allow you to really mobile. I haven't seen them, but I've heard about them. Um, and so, you know, Starlink now has gone from, you have to be in a certain place so you can be anywhere. And so, um, this is, and I'm still trying to figure out with my, with my old, my old, uh, caravan, Dodge caravan, I'm thinking of putting the Starlink, right. Installing it into the roof, like <laughs> just putting it into the roof. And I just got to find a good place to park, um, or at least a mount for it, um, so that I can stream from, or just surf from anywhere. Um, so we'll we'll see how that goes, but I think that's what it's designed towards. Do you know, Alex? If, does that have anything to do with the professional tier that they recently introduced? Um, I do not know. I just don't. I haven't um, haven't been keeping up. They've been moving pretty quickly, um, and I haven't uh, haven't seen haven't seen those there. Let's see here. Okay, interesting. We'll have to look more into it, Chris. Uh, maybe ask us again. Uh, let's go to our next question. And it's from Chris again from Lafayette, Indiana. Talk radio on terrestrial broadcast seems to be dying off in the Midwest. Is this just a regional trend or a general trend? Mitchell? Uh, I'm not sure what uh, you're using for your information. Talk radio is probably the salvation of radio as we know it. Um, going hyper-local is, uh, is the direction you want to go, but I'll, I'll reserve that for uh, Mark, who's going to follow me here with his answers to it. So I would say that it's not a regional trend or a general trend unless the talk radio continues to be run by the media giants out there like iHeart and companies like that where they syndicate the same programming across the country. This doesn't make sense. I think it needs to be done locally and it needs to be locally focused. Go ahead, Mark. I hope it's not going anywhere. Actually, it's quite interesting. Um, there's a gentleman who's pretty... Uh, pretty well known in the radio community, Holland Cook, who came out with an article this week in Tarko's magazine that says, can news save FM from talk radio? So it's interesting where I think there's just 
this goes through a little bit of a cycle period after elections. We've had, we've got a lot of the elections coming up. People get a little burned out from all the election coverage. And so I think uh, people turn away from talk. You'll see the radio slip down right after elections and then come back up again. So we'll see how it goes. Alex? And I think that, I think that this is a, also kind of what we've been talking about here is the idea that talk radio lets you tune into the con- kind of conversation that you want to hear. And so I, I think it's actually pretty energetic, but I do think that more and more of it, like what we're doing here, will move to the internet. And then maybe back to radio, because again, we're trying to figure out ways that we can deliver what we're doing here back to radio. Um, so it's still, you, we just have to remember that radio is still getting out there and for solid half to two thirds of the world, radio is still a pretty big deal. <laughs> so, so it, and, it, and it doesn't require any bandwidth and it's a pr- pretty low cost distribution method. Smart radio coming soon. Mm-hmm. Let's go to our next question. Tony Mobley from Noonan, Georgia asks, going forward, I plan to do a one minute video on my upcoming guests on LinkedIn Live, other social media, and on conversations with Tony Mobley. Is this a good strategy? Alex? Tony, are you, are you talking about a one minute LinkedIn Live or just a one minute video that's about the LinkedIn Live? A uh, one minute LinkedIn Live to, to speak to guests that are coming on. And part of the reason why I emphasize LinkedIn Live is because that is where I get most engagement from. I don't get a lot of engagement from Facebook and I don't get any real engagement from other platforms, but I do get a lot of engagement from LinkedIn Live. And so Mm -hmm. I wanted to sort of focus on doing those LinkedIn Lives. And and at, at some point in the future, I hope to be able to simulcast conversation with Tony Mobley on LinkedIn Live as we are doing it um, live on Wednesday nights. Right. Interesting. Uh, yeah, they, usually I wouldn't recommend doing a one minute live because it kind of takes time to warm it up, <laughs> you know, and, and have people see it. And then, it, and then you, and then you just stopped. So, I mean, if I was going to do a one minute video, I would definitely do a, do a, um, uh, I would definitely do a video, just, just do a post about it, about it coming up, maybe record that, but I don't know if I would do a LinkedIn live for, a, for I don't know if I do any live that's one minute long. Okay. Um, I risk. Thank you. Yeah. I, I tend to agree with Alex on this one, um, Tony, but what you might do is if you wanted to have a little pre interview with your host and then took maybe one minute or a highlight or maybe a highlight of that, that interaction and then post that, that might be something that's, uh, Usable. I think that with that 60 second uh, end and close, you know, like Alex said, to, to, to get it spooled up and then spooled down. If you we need to get a, a quick interaction needs to be concise and to the point. And, you know, you're just going to be uh, exchanging greetings for the first 30 seconds and then saying goodbye for the for the second one. But if you maybe if you condense that into a into a short, that's basically the size of a short. Right. Uh, Mark, you have a thought? I was just thinking, you, Tony, use it as a teaser to point everyone to the upcoming show that's about to to go. Yeah, hopefully we've given you something to think about, Tony. All right, let's go to our next question. And Chris Widener is back from Lafayette. Uh, it seems like different professions have regionalisms in their jargon that can lead to confusion. Any tips on where to find translation resources? Dave? Yeah, this is something that comes up for me quite a lot. I have to deal with City Hall quite a lot, and they speak their own language. Uh, But it's true, if you get a bunch of engineers in a room together, they all start talking and nobody knows what they're saying. And I know from talking to other directors and producers, you know, we use TLAs and all kinds of language and code numbers and that. Nobody knows what we're talking about. So it's a difficult thing to handle, and I don't imagine there's any actual way to create a dictionary or translate these things because as it says in the question it's kind of regional um i was telling someone earlier that you know tbc is difficult for me to translate as to be continued because i come from time-based correctors and that and it it was like embedded in my head so uh, i find it difficult to get people to come out of that jargon and speak you know person talk so yeah i don't see a dictionary or translation anytime soon go ahead john I, w- I would say it's incumbent on the speaker to make sure, sure their message is heard by their listener. And so the speaker should really be defining their terms as necessary. When I started my current position, I didn't know anything about call centers or the medical field. So 
what I personally did is I wrote down in every meeting any words I didn't understand, and afterward I asked my boss what the words meant. I put that all into a spreadsheet, and now it's on our knowledge management system, so all of our new hires can see uh, the definitions that I found. Yeah, maybe a feedback system to where you recognize whether you're assuming you, you know you that your audience knows what you're talking about or not. Alex? Yeah, it, it, the bottom line is this is how languages get different and they how they how they evolve is because they're more efficient for what for that region or that profession you know so people are using language that is you know they they it becomes a kind of an agreed uh proficiency you know we we call things rfis for instance in here you know room to you know room for improvement but you know they mean a lot of other things requests for information and you know, they have a lot of other meanings in other areas and so, you know, human beings just tend to get more efficient about how they talk, depending on wh what they're talking about all the time. They're constantly shortening things. It's just the nature of, uh, I, I had a friend that, um, from Kenya and he, he was telling me that in Nairobi, uh, there's these, um, there's a language called shank or that's, they, they kind of, they kind of refer to it that it's a mixture of Swahili and, uh, English. And, um, and what's interesting about it is, or shank, uh, anyway, so he said it's moving so fast that if he's gone for six months, he barely understands what's happening because it's only used by the buses that take people around and they, they're constantly adding new words and changing things. And it's this amalgamation and they'll speak half the, half the sentence in English and half in Swahili and, and they'll pull. And then it just becomes this new language that is constantly evolving because so many people are mixing um, all the time. And so it's just, I found it to be an, an interesting lab, you know, as far as how, how the stuff evolves, but that's a place, and especially where there's a lot of languages that evolve um, that mix with each other, you know, is, you know, so when there's a lot of people from different cultures, that's when a new language kind of starts to come out because, you know, and, and even if you look at, I mean, there's some, I talked to a, a linguist about Pittsburgh because we have a tendency to t tie everything together and do a bunch of things. But they, they said that comes from the fact that we had a large Polish, Italian, German, you know, like all these folks were together and they started just slowly talking a little bit faster and we're very impatient too. So. <laughs> Like, did you, uh, this is the jo Josh order, did, in Pittsburgh, did you eat yet? Is just eat a yet. really, G-Chet, yep, exactly, G-Chet. You know, that's, 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 and that's how languages get built. <laughs> you know, and Pittsburgh has its own language. Yeah. There's whole books on it, like Pittsburghese, um, because, but it's because generally that these languages are, it's also the pressure on who needed to say that and what were they doing while they said it over and over and over again. Um, and people just tend to shorten everything to make it more efficient. Yeah. Um, I, I wonder too, because I've been, I think with just having access to different communities, being able to tune into different localities, you learn some of, I, I've, I've incorporated different pronunciations and different vocabulary that is colloquial to certain areas, just because we Zoom with people of different areas and we learn their, their local. So, I wonder if it's kind of a give and take uh, from both directions. Well, there's there's a lot of things that, like for instance, in Africa, some of our African uh, partners will they use English words, and I said I asked like, well, why do you use the English word? And they're like, because it's a lot more efficient than ours. <laughs> like we don't have that. Like in one in uh, uh, in one language, uh, uh, saying round like a rounded corner is a gradual they, like literally they say a gradual change from one 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 uh, side to the other you know like it's you know they, they they don't have a word for it so they just say round and um you know i think that there are definitely foreign languages like i find that kawaii is, is much 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 expresses cute way better <laughs> you know, which is a japanese term uh you know for it or or um schadenfreude you know in german has a it just is the right word for that thing, right? You know, like it's, it's the, you know, and so it, when you get more cultures, you, uh, you, you, you start to take those efficiencies and, and, and mix them into, into your language. Jonas taught me, Vishlem Besseren. I'm sure I've ma I mangled that. Sorry, Jonas. Uh, we've got to move on now because we're going to get into our educational uh, channel. So let's, uh, let's take our next question. Next question for Mark Giuliani in Washington, D.C. here on the panel. Regarding computer security, I understand how to encrypt a local drive in Mac OS, but can you encrypt an external RAID drive like a promised Pegasus 32 using File Vault? Alex, real quick. I believe you can, but I think you have to use the, the hardware RAID software. So you have to have the, the, the Vault or have to have the RAID present itself as a single drive back to... 
um, to the Mac to do that. I'm not 100% sure, but I believe that it, it has to present itself as a drive. You, you, I think if you use software RAID inside of the Mac, I don't think that'll work. So that's my, that's my I, I think that that's true, but I'm not 100% sure. All right, next question. Douglas Carmichael is here. When creating content for younger audiences, how do you gauge how they're engaging with the content if they can't articulate what they like or dislike? Alex? Eye tracking. That's the typical way when we do it before language is we, we uh, track their eyes. <laughs> so we, there's a little uh, sensor that you put above the monitor. This isn't for everyone at their house, but when you're trying to figure out whether the, the um, content is engaging so someone who's without language, uh, we just track what they're looking at. And you, and you actually can develop very accurate heat maps that sit over top of the video. We actually, we, I don't do it anymore, but we used to do this a lot. And we'd mix it with um, watching TV shows, watching ads, looking at print ads, looking at all those things. And what's amazing is if you watch about 100 people, in, um, you'll get a heat map that is remarkably stable. <laughs> like, you know, it's like, it, it just, it is what, what the, we used to be able to put pictures in the middle of an ad, in, in the middle of a website, and knowing that no one would ever see it. We say, did you see, what did you see here? And they, no one would ever see that because we watched the heat map and we realized the way that they were looking at it. They, they just, no one ever looked at literally something that sits in the middle because of something above it, below it, to the side, their, their eyes, and it's like a lower brain thing. It's not a, it doesn't matter whether they're men or women, doesn't matter. I mean, it's like literally they just, the human being will look at it a certain way, 98%, 99% of the time, which is a very fascinating thing. Anyway, um, but, but with kids before language, it's, it's eye tracking. Back in my day, we just had to listen for cues. Let's go to our next question. And the next one's from me, and I'm going to take the liberty of modifying it slightly. I, I'd like to know what people call their media centers in their rooms. What do you, what do you actually refer to them as? Mitchell? Or, sorry, Nigel? Okay, we should have time to do this quickly. There's family living lounge, which is where you sit and watch TV with a the family. There's the home theater, which is a dark room. And the growing media room which is like the home theater, but actually the lights are on and you make it look like a bar. If you want something to, to aspire to and you have 14 inch plus ceilings, I suggest the three by three of 65 inch televisions. It's a fabulous way to watch. Mitchell. Yeah, I remember living room was the room that we weren't allowed in. It was covered in plastic. <laughs> Let's go to our next question. Douglas Carmichael is here. I'm watching Office Hours on an LG TV with various image enhancements, motion compensations, a.k.a. true motion features. And when I turn them off, it seems like the image is a lot better. And audio video sync is clear. Why could that be? Go ahead, Alex. And when you have the image, the other images, the image compensation on, it's adding frames. It's literally, we, we're sending it 30 frames a second, and then it's adding three frames between every frame. And it's making that up. <laughs> it's, just, it's just making up those frames. And so it's may try to make it look smoother. But what it does is it just makes it look softer. And next question. James Babbitt in San Diego, California. I'd like to watch Office Hours Education Hour. And on Sunday, when it's Office Hours and not on YouTube, will Office Hours continue to email the Office Hours link? Yeah, I'll just jump in there real quick. The answer is yes. We'll, starting next week, we'll start sending out an email to everyone. It just won't come from Zoom. So it'll be a, a, a serv or MailChimp or whatever. We'll manage that from now on. So uh, we'll be working on that over the weekend to get that ready to go. And so you'll start to get the, the daily updates. At first, they'll look pretty much the same as they did before, and then they'll get better. All right. Well, that's the end of our first hour. Please stay tuned. Uh, we're going to go into our second hour. Now we have Dave Trotman on, and he's going to be talking about the project approach. Um, and Dave, do you want to introduce our your guest for our education hour sure yep coming up we'll be joined by shantu mano to help us understand more about the project approach uh it's an approach to teaching and uh, we'll take questions about that stay with us through the little break and while we prepare our program and settle our panelists in their chairs education hour starts in just a little while When are we coming back? Right after these commercials. We don't have any commercials. Credits, they're the same thing. No, the commercials are people. I see. <laughs> That's a good idea. I think we 
We just got to talk to the host about that. Oh, yeah, I'm going to talk to that host about that. We should tighten it up a little bit to finish it like 755. What do you think? Does that sound like a good idea? That's great. Okay. It's done. It's been decided. Without even raising our voice. That's right. It's Robert's rule of order. Exactly. This is the... Yeah, a negative 30 loves. It's a whisper conference. This is how we decide everything. No, this is how we speak. When we have important meetings, we just whisper the whole time. It really keeps our emotions in check. Exactly, exactly. But if you yell really loud like this, my my, my daughter calls that a, a quiet scream. <laughs> All right. I'll be right back. It's all you, Dave. Good morning and welcome to Education Hour. This hour is going to be about the project approach. Now, I've got to start with a confession, maybe two of them. I first became aware of the project approach uh, through a collaboration with Dr. Sylvia Chart at the U of A and uh, uh, here in Alberta, when I was an instructional video producer for the Faculty of Education. I was so taken by the approach that I enrolled my young son into the lab school and he benefited from six years under this method. Um, he's now a rocket engineer. Uh, much of what I documented about the program for them uh, was the method, and uh, it helped me to work with industry, government, and community groups uh, in my own consulting, and I still apply many of those principles, which you'll be learning about a bit today. The second confession is that I joined Office Hours because I think it represents a bold extension of this idea, and I wanted to be able to bring this approach forward to recognize it. 
So let me introduce our guest today. Her name is Shantu Mano. She worked with Lillian Katz and Sylvia Chard, who promoted this new approach to teaching at the U of A and uh, was for many years a teacher at the Child Study Center, which is where my son went. She's currently CEO of Carbon Busters, which is a whole different departure, but she's here today because of her early work with this teaching approach. So welcome, Shantu. Thanks for having me. Um, by way of explaining it uh, in short form, um, the project approach leads with children. Uh, children have a strong disposition to explore and discover. This is natural. And the project approach builds on that natural curiosity. And they enable children to interact or question or connect or problem solve and communicate, reflect, and more. And this kind of authentic learning uh, extends beyond the classroom to each student's home, community, nation, and the rest of the world. It essentially makes the learning of real stuff and the children are active participants in and shapers of the world. So it's building on a natural curiosity to engage, problem solve, and connect. Uh, what I'm hoping today is people who are watching us and are on Mucana will put questions to us after we've seen some of what the approach is. And I'm going to give Shanto a moment to expand or add to what I've just said about the project approach. Mm -hmm. uh, Dave, you've got it right. I mean, uh, I remember Carl in the classroom. Um, he was very curious and friendly, wonderful to have him. Uh, so project approach uh, is taking real world topics. So children are engaged or are looking at the world a certain way, how they see the world. And our, as teachers, our job was to observe and, and notice what they were interested in. And then we would pick topics that we can study in depth uh, with them. And um, and we weave the curriculum through that particular topic. So, you know, we could be working in woodworking. Um, children who inter were interested in uh, working with wood would work work at that station, but a lot of the language arts would go there. They would have to record their observations. They'd have to write about it. They would have to present the information at some point, represent what they understand. Uh, so the, the whole process happened starting from idea generation and have, coming up with questions. Um, I know that clipboards became part of our tool. We, we always, all the children in the Child Study Center carried a clipboard and would write down questions. And then our job was, was to find people who can answer those questions. So often, you know, if it were, if we were designing a playground, for instance, we would go to an actual construction site and we would bug all the folks, you know, safely on, on the other side of the fence and saying, can we ask you a question, please? And that would be the children's jobs to find out more. And then of course, um, you know, field trips meant more questions. And then we would bring those experts to, into the classroom and then we would, you know, study it a bit longer. So some of these topics can run for months, um, you know, you know, so someone comes with the, I, I remember one child came with a cast on, on his hand or something. We ended up in, 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 in the hospital getting a temporary cast on to understand what that meant. And then we studied bones for three months. So it's lots of fun. And I, I remember that moment because it was probably the time when I decided that my child had to be part of this. And it right. was when they had built a whole clinic as the demonstration moment at the end of the project. Right. And parents were invited to come to the center. They would be received in the reception area by people in lab coats. And yes. then the kids would take them and register them for an x-ray. And then they would have to lie down on this floor with this black construction over them as the x-ray machine. Mm -hmm. and then a child would take a black piece of paper with chalk right or draw the lung that they were x-raying. That's right. And then they would take body. that to the radiologist, to the child who's playing radiologist, and they would interpret the information and then send them on their way. And all the parents got to go through that program. And I just thought, they're experts now. They just don't have the real gear, but they understand the whole process. And the wonderful um, thing is what children have noticed in real life situations where they go to a clinic, they made us sit there for 10 minutes sometimes before they would let us into those rooms. You know how long it takes for us to move from the sitting area to the actual room. So they'd make us, nope, nope, you've got to wait the 15, the full 15, 10 minutes before you can mm -hmm. go in. Yeah, they take the role on very seriously, very as serious. most children do when you give them a, a job to do. Mm -hmm. uh, I wanted to ask if this benefits more from team teaching or is it something individual teachers can, can adopt 
rather I, I think right individual now. teachers can, but it's better if if it's a collaboration between teachers because you do um, you know uh, work with each other's strengths and and um, the expertise at the table as well and interest that you may all have as well as a teacher. So we had three people in the in the in our classrooms, you know. So we had different roles, but uh, certainly we um, grouped children into three groups, and you know, then we can work with them intensely. Uh, things like math and language arts, of course, we had a special time where we would do certain kinds of um, work that needed to be done. But then we the rest of the day was project approach, where we would uh, pursue our topic, whatever that topic was. Well, other pursuits like math and art were part of the whole program anyway. Yes, People drew they things, evolved. they measured things, they recorded mm -hmm. things. Yeah. yeah. Um, I guess if it were in the upper classes, the uh, up in mid, um, well, the middle school, uh, six, seven, eight, nine age group, um, they have more than one teacher. So if it's a project that extends beyond that one class. Mm -hmm. um, how do you see it being sort of coordinated? Do you think the school itself has to adopt it or uh, can just think, teachers adopt it? Mm -hmm. Now, I was only there up to grade six. So this was the lab school for the Department of Elementary Education. So um, we simply, when we came into those planning meetings, we would invite teachers. So maybe the grade three teacher would like to work with grade six teacher. And then... Um, so they'd be a bit of, you know, uh, older kids can help support the younger kids to do a particular kind of work that they may not be able to do on their own, uh, especially in woodworking and places like that, you know, where we have real tools. I mean, you can hear four-year-olds tell older kids, this is a serious place. If you don't behave a certain way, they will take away your tools. So they're very, very clear about the parameters around which where we can work. And, and I think that's one of the things we do in Project Approach. At the first month, we spend a lot of time building those relationships and understanding how we're going to work together in this classroom, that we have real tools that there's, it's serious, uh, that when someone comes into the classroom, there are uh, children who go up to them and say, introduce themselves and say, welcome to our school. How can I help you? And that happens when you have 60 uh, teaching, you know, the, the students who are learning how to teach enter the classroom. It's the same thing. It's the children who go and greet them and invite them into their classroom. Uh, we're there to simply sa scaffold them and help them get to the place where they need to be. Great. So we have a couple of questions on deck. I'm not going to go to them right now, but I encourage people to put their questions in. And uh, I'm going to open it to the panel members who are watching this with us, if there's anything they'd like to ask Shantu about. Alex? I guess, I guess, yeah. So I, I had, uh, I mean, I, I, I'm firmly... I firmly believe in project-based. I mean, that's pretty much all I care about <laughs> is project-based learning. And I think that it points towards a, uh, this is the way humans have learned for the last at least 100,000 years. <laughs> like, you know, like, and so the idea that we're going to, that we're going to get a lecture sit, standing somewhere is a relatively new upcoming uh, that, that I think is a fad, <laughs> you know, like, you know, of, of lecturing um, is that, you know, what we did when we grew up was that we, we were around other people that did what we were eventually going to do, you know, for a long time, you know, and we asked lots of, we were, were I think that kids are designed and, you know, designed to ask lots of questions. <laughs> you know, like, so they, they ask lots of questions because that is, I mean, that is the, literally the human design is to be very, very small and asking every question and trying to absorb all the information as fast as we possibly can. Mm -hmm. And I think, unfortunately, most of our school system beats that out of them over time, you know, by, by giving them a lot of boring lectures and, and so on and so forth and, yeah. and not really opening it up to questions. This is why this forum generally is almost all questions is because I think that, that we want to re-engage that, that process. Um, do you see areas that, that project in a project based doesn't work? Is there any area that you go, well, it's, that, that is, this isn't the right one to, to do? Cause I haven't found it yet. <laughs> I'm just curious if you see like, like areas that you think that, that um, it, it's better to not go down that path. Oh, I mean, I agree with you completely. I think constructive curriculum, as we call it, where we're engaged together as a team to learn something is much more powerful and engaging than any other forms where you sit in classrooms and there's someone in the front, you know, who's lecturing you. Uh, and the younger you are, the less 
able you are to sit still and listen and you know and I haven't you know, I, I'm I'm in my fifties now. I still haven't gotten over that problem. I, no, I can sit still no, for I, a couple I, minutes, but, but same I here. I love I love being able to touch things and feel things. I want to know what's behind the wall. Uh, you know, we just don't accept any of those things. And we love it that we can actually go do that. And when we built a playground, that's what we did. We did a miniature scale of a actual playground. We had students come in and work with us and show us how to measure and I uh, you know uh, you know figure out how to scale buildings. We we did all of that. And then we built that very same model outside in real, you know, in, in a sort of a real way. And we brought in carpenters and framers to help us. But uh, certainly the kids learned a lot of skills that way. It's 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 engaging. I mean, you want to do this. You want to get off bed and just get into your projects. That's very important, I think. Um, I, I think math and language arts were a couple of things. I think we sort of set aside time and we said, um, I don't know, multiplication table, <laughs> things like that. We, we did set a little bit of time to sort of understand how we would study it. We gave them some strategies and how to, um, you know, learn it. It's good to have those things in your, in your head when you're doing mental math. And you definitely want to encourage children to do that. Yeah. Uh, we want less of that calculator thing at the early stage. We want people to actually think through numbers and large numbers and how the numbers work together. So that's, uh, but always with, with project reports, the cool thing is you can do that within context. So, you know, like I said, we build a playground. There's a lot of math in it. Um, we, uh, at, at the end of the day, after we built the playground, we had um, some of the kids wanted to grow food. So we harvested them in the fall and then we ended up having a farmer's market and in, into the, you know, inviting the Minister of Education to come open it. So we would sort of always be out there trying to connect with the community to come back and help us uh, put the call out among parents to get bring them back into the classrooms as well. It's important for children to see that we can all work together um, to do that. So yeah, agreed. I think that is one of the best ways to engage in learning. Okay. Uh, just to Alex's point about lecturing, uh, I believe that lecturing caught on and was established because it's easy to measure and that the project approach is a little more difficult to evaluate yes. whether the students are because we're teaching in a lecture toward an outcome whereas in the project approach the outcome isn't clear until about halfway through the project and then you can start targeting where the uh, advances of the students are and that sort of thing uh john yeah i think um and i would add that lectures also help you standardize the curriculum and scale it up to large groups. Um, my understanding, and please correct me if I'm wrong here, is my understanding is that essentially the project approach with capital P, capital A, is you have the kids identify what they want to learn and build the curriculum around that. Mm -hmm. um, and so I'm kind of curious as to how those discussions get started uh, for those people who are wanting to dip their toes in this approach. Mm -hmm. Well, with younger children, they're they're seeing the world a certain way. They're already observers. They they're curious about many many things. So a leak under the sink ended up, and you know we ended up doing plumbing for two weeks or three weeks. Uh, we brought a plumber in. We took a toilet apart, put it back together. Um, you know we, we had unit blocks and um, hollow blocks in the hall in the block area. We would build. A uh, system, you know, the the bathroom, whatever it was, we ended up doing that, uh, and the kids really understood. And we had parents come to us and say, "I have no idea how to take a toilet apart and put it back together. Can we please come and join you?" So that was lots of fun for children to see parents coming and saying, "What do you know?" And the children then were teaching the parents what they had learned and uh, you know understood. Uh, in, in terms of uh, toilets or, you know, showers, it was the same thing. So the leak under the sink brought that on. So it's always something that triggers the conversation. And then suddenly folks, uh, you know, children say, can we learn more about this? Can we, you know, they ask, start asking questions and those clipboards come out. And then we know as teachers to look at these ideas and say there's enough in here to sort of go in to depth and study it for a while. Uh, and then we look at it from our, our point of view, there's things like, you know, there's certain pieces we have to, we are mandated, let's say, to introduce to the children during a year, particular year based on their grade. Then it's our job then to see how do we weave that piece in, you know, if it's, I know there's things like colors and all kinds of things when you're early childhood. And as you get older, there's electricity and, you know, all kinds of other stuff. And so if you're doing a playground, then we could show them how a simple circuit works you know we, there's things ways that we can bring those pieces of edu uh, that we need to address into the project approach and uh alex how how hard is it to scale like i think that's that we, we talked about that a little bit like when you're if you're individualizing every 
uh, mm. lesson to every student? Is it, you know, because for, for instance, I taught visual effects uh, for San Francisco yep. State University. And, and um, one of the things we didn't, we didn't individualize it as much as we all did the same project together. It was a project. It wasn't Yes. Capital P, capital A. Yeah. But I didn't lecture at all. What I did is we said, we're going to all do this together and everyone's going to do their own version of it. So I'm going to give you, we're going to go out and shoot a visual effects shot, for instance. And then I'm going to give you all the content and then we're all going to work on it together and you'll all have questions. But really the whole class was just me answering why this isn't working or how to make this better or what. So the whole, but, but the advantage there was that it was a, it was a shared experience in the sense that there's 20 people working on the same problems, mm -hmm. you know, in the same, at the same time, so that my answers were applicable to all of them, you know, so whatever I'm answering there, it makes sense. It, it, it's, it's deepening all of their understandings. Whereas I think that if they all were doing their own visual effect shot, it, for me, it would be, uh, it'd be difficult to, to move them as far forward together. Does that, does that make sense? Yes, for sure. I mean, I think that's what we did too. It was, all, we picked a topic, um, whether it was plumbing or playground or, you know, studying uh, culture in, in Japan, whatever it was, it was all of us working together. But then as we do then is all, all I mean, the different, we have different ways to represent what we understand. Right world to be. So we offered that opportunity to the children. So the woodworkers would go to woodworking and create something uh, to show what they understood, what they had learned. And the writers would be writing poems or, you know, articles. Uh, but everyone had to present the information at some point. So they learned the skill to how to stand in front of a classroom and say something uh, that they had, want, you know, that had learned and want to share. And then a project to pro, pro, our projects always ended with celebration as well. So we, we start with um, planning and, you know, understanding and coming up with those questions and those field trips. Uh, and then in the middle of the project, we're representing what we understand to, you know, that we've learned. And then at the end of the day, we bring the community back into our classrooms to celebrate as well. So the children get an opportunity to, you know, either, play, uh, have a theater going, or, you know, um, it could be a piece of writing, it could be a woodworking piece, whatever it was, they, the representations were introduced and into the, uh, into the community as well. So it was a wonderful way to bring everybody together, but you're right. It, it is all of us working together on this one That's topic. Good. Yeah. Okay. We're going to open the door to the questions from outside and, uh, we'll move to, uh, the first question. And it comes, well, I'm going to let John read my question for me. Thanks. Uh, it is actually from me in Reno, Nevada. What are some tips for teachers who are required to integrate specific age-related competencies into a lesson plan and they want to use the project approach? Yeah. Um, I mean, it, it totally depends on your classroom and the children that you have and the relationships you have because you're setting the tone in the classroom to how to do project approach. So as long as we all understand we're all going to work together on this particular thing, then you, you weave it in as uh, within context, I think. It's hard to say uh, exactly what you have to do as a teacher, but if you're collaborating, there's more happening. Uh, if you're the only teacher in the classroom, there's only certain things you can do because you do have to, you, you know, depending on the number of kids you have in your classroom, I know classrooms are getting bigger. You know, you used to just have 20, 25, and now it's 30, 35, whatever it is. Uh, so the management style of a classroom now changes. You I think part, part of the time what we did was we invited children. Uh, we just assumed that children had expertise when they came into our classroom. So we would ask children, um, so what are you good at? Well, you know, what would you like to do? And have them lead groups and, 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 and some of the topics as well. So their jobs would be to go and do a bit of research, find out more, bring it back to, into the classroom so that others can learn from that or, you know, form their own group and then delve deeper into it. So it was, it was, it's just really contextual. You have to sort of see what kind of classroom. Sometimes you have very active members in the classroom. So then there may be different strategies you have to put in place. And in other times you have very logical, rational uh, kids and, and you can do different things with them. So yeah, it varies. And for me, this is exactly what office hours is. And even after hours. 
it's a collection of people who all have expertise and we're just finding out that one shares an interest with another uh, one has expertise in an area you wouldn't expect and they jump in and say well this is how it should go so i think for me connecting this to office hours is is key to this discussion john yeah specifically what i'm thinking is if i'm a third grade teacher and my principal says the kids have to have a demonstrate an understanding of fractions by the end of the year and the students don't want to learn about pizza as the project that's the only thing i can think of obvious fractions yep. how do you how do you like what are some tips for a teacher who wants to have the best of both worlds well pizza is perfect let's let's have a snack and you know you can talk about it right there with with the way that you slice it up uh, but that's only one aspect of it there sometimes math we we in our, in, our, in our case anyway in our classrooms we did have a particular time where we work together with children on very specific kinds of things. Um, you know, games is another way to bring some of the some of the math concepts into the table. We might play board games. We might, you know, again, it's it's all contextual and depending on what other pieces are going on in the classroom. Um, sometimes it's good to have more people, so we might invite parents in to help support the classroom, so we can do more uh, and delve deeper into certain kinds of um, strategies. Uh, so, grade three teacher, um, you know. If there are other teachers, a grade four teacher or a grade two teacher who, who can get together, then there's a way to collaborate and do more of those kinds of things. So fractions, yeah, I'd say go with the pizza. <laughs> All right, let's move to another question. Eric Billings in Washington, D.C. asks, the project approach sounds like primary education through a technical college. How much resistance did the school district encounter from traditionalists in the community or in authority? So the Child Study Center uh, has been around since the 60s. It was the lab school uh, that was created to teach teachers how to teach and, you know, and, and obviously support children and how to engage in learning. Um, I came uh, along and was part of the teaching team in the 90s and uh, was there for nine years. Uh, so it changed every every teacher or you know uh, folks who come into the into our teams also change the a little bit of that project way of teaching changed based on our personalities and what we wanted to do uh, I was very privileged to have dr Sylvia chard as our pedagogical leader so we could go to her and ask her questions you know we'd often go to the faculty club on Friday and all we talk about is what we've observed in the classroom. We also gave ourselves a chance, of, like everyone would get like five, 10 minutes to observe children as well. We would spend a little bit of time looking to see what the children were seeing and what they were doing and what they were saying and record those. And then we would have an understanding of um, what can happen in that classroom. So every semester or every year, it was different, different children, different perspective. Um, yeah, so it, at the center, it was mostly um, constructive curriculum in the way that we can weave the curriculum in and topics came from the children and us. It was always, always sometimes also from us because, you know, we saw something that was interesting. We'd ask the children, what do you think? Do you think this is of interest? Should we should we look at it? Uh, is there anyone here who'd like to take it on? And then a small group of kids would say, oh, I'd like to find out more. And then they would inspire the rest of the classroom to kind of delve into it more. So it, it varied all the time. Um, but it was fun for us too. It wasn't just lesson plans, right? We, we, had, we had lesson plans, but it wasn't the only thing we looked at. Well, I guess part of that comes up in my mind. Was it more difficult to plan for a project approach lesson than it is for other teachers who are just following a curriculum style. Hmm. Yeah, I mean, I think we had the we had the lesson plan in the sense that we knew what we had to teach grade three kids, for instance. Um, but that didn't mean that we didn't do topics that grade fours were doing or you know grade fives were doing. If within the context it came up, we simply bring it up and we'll learn something from it and when we get to grade four and five we do it more in depth so that we'd learn a little bit more and you know the children would be engaged for a longer period of time on those topics um yeah okay let's move to the next question from myself again in reno nevada how does the project approach 
compare or contrast to other types of project-based education? What makes it distinct? Um, I think project approach for us anyway was uh, real world topics. It was you know topics that were um, interesting and engaging for the children. That was our focus. Uh, we certainly, as I said, weave the curriculum through it. Uh, there are other schools, like in Italy, we have the Reggio Emilia approach, where they looked at young children as individuals who are curious about their world. And so they came out from, um, um, learn, there was more of those sort of hands-on kinds of things they were doing with the children. Uh, we, our focus was, we up, went up to grade six. So, you know, we had the curriculum to weave through as well. So it just, it, it varied in terms of um, how we manage the projects as teachers. Okay, we'll take the next question. Douglas Carmichael asks, can the project approach work in elementary or middle school settings? Definitely. Yeah, we definitely used it in the early early stages, early childhood onwards. We, I think the Child Study Center had junior kindergarten even, so three and a half year olds to four and four and a half year olds started at the center, and then we went all the way up to grade six. Mm, and I, I believe there's more uh, there's more work being done in early, the later stages. The sort of the um, what's the next stage? Um, Junior high and then high. Junior school. high and and yeah and and high school is a little different as well. Again, you yeah, there's more that you can do with older kids for sure. Well, there was a project I seem to recall, just an experiment done in Sherwood Park, where a high school adopted this and tried it out. Have I got that That's wrong? That's right. Yeah, we did. We we had a so we because we were the lab school. Often teachers would call us and say, "Can we come and discuss this with you? How do we do it?" And often because there were three of us, we could go into another classroom as well and and help support some of the work. All right, we'll take the next question, please. Josh Kaufman in Pittsburgh, Pennsylvania, asks Shantu Manu and the panel. How important is the concept of play in your learning strategy? What are practical boundaries to keep fun projects from losing focus, assuming focus is the priority? Go ahead, Shantu. Oh, okay. I wanted to give the panel a chance to say something. <laughs> Um, I think I reminded Dave that I'm not a morning person. So, you know, mm -hmm. I'm only now waking up slowly. Um, by 10, I should be good. <laughs> mm. All right. So uh, the question was. In terms uh, of fun. Yeah. Right. I mean, the children do that themselves. As long as they engage, the focus is there. Uh, they're interested. They engage. They want to learn more. They come and ask us questions. Um we bring in the experts and we sort of feed that focus. We feed their interest and engagement as well by bringing people that are interesting. Uh, when we did the bones, we had this incredibly competent, uh, wonderful man at the UFA. We would bring him and he was wonderful with the children. He would come in and talk about all kinds of things, not just the bones, but also other things like bees and wasps. And he got them really interested. So the next topic became bees and wasps. And so it's, it's always about the people that you bring together and then, the children go for it. They they are they're there. They engaged. Um, and when when children are no longer focused, it's important to also bring them back and say we can see that. Do do we think we're done now with the studying of this particular topic? Uh, and if we are, then let's celebrate what we've learned. And so then we sort of head into that celebratory space where we can bring the parents together and you know invite them to learn what we've learned and. Um, um, connect with the community as well. So then you can shift it now into that sort of next topic. What are the next topics? We're starting to explore this other other part of the thing. So we, we don't have to, the focus is only as long as the children are engaged, then we do it. And then we move on to another topic. Alex? Yeah, one of the things that, you know, the, we built a media school in Rwanda. And, um, and so we had, you know, we've had hundreds of students go through there. And uh, it's been generally very successful. One of the interesting things is that we thought that what we would do is have them take two tutorials so that, that we could find out which ones we're able to, which ones we should bring into the intake. Because our intakes uh, there, we might have 50 seats available for each intake and we might have 500 to 1,000 applicants. 
And so we have to figure out, you know, who is going to be the, who is the best. And, and there's some other things like, how do we represent all, all the different things that we want to do? We want to make sure that, that we have a certain percentage of women. Sometimes our, our intakes are all women, you know, um, and then, uh, but also, you know, just taking into a lot of different uh, things into account, but who are the best ones to, to fit into this, this model? And so we would have them, we started opening it up where we'd have them do lots of tutorials and we built these little tutorials. They go through the tutorials, they come out the other end and whoever was successful at that, we, um, we started using that. We actually found that that was not nearly as, as successful as we thought. What we found was is that the students that can do the testing and the students that can do the work mm -hmm. often didn't cross over. <laughs> like, like, you know, it was like, it was like an interesting, like we thought that would be a way to kind of just see if they're willing to work through these things and figure it all out. But there are some students that are really good. If you just give them a tutorial, they'll just, but you put them into an actual project and they just didn't, you know, and I, and that's when we really understood that we just have to figure out how to do more and more projects, include more and more people, and then, you know, keep on funneling it through because it was, it, you know, the, um, you know, book smarts and, and street smarts are, we, you know, in, in almost every industry are very different. And we've almost, I used to say that um, the theoretical knowledge about operational technique, you know, operational things. So like how to do something, theoretical knowledge was worth about one hundredth of uh, practical knowledge. And I've grown to believe that it's actually in the negatives. <laughs> like it's actually almost a damaging to someone to have a lot of theoretical knowledge about something they have never done um, because they make a bunch of assumptions that are just not connected to reality, you know, and I think we see this in our government all the time. So anyway, so the, um, but, but the, uh, you know, the, but take, you know, theoretical knowledge is, is so important that people have hands on, have been their knowledge about any subject that they're making decisions about. Um, so I just think that what you're doing is so, so important. Mm -hmm. I had the same experience with uh, the Defense Department because they are all into lectures and that, but they came to realize that it only sticks when they get out and do what they're supposed to do. They, they take on the job and take on the role, and they hate sitting in the classroom. So I kind of applied the project approach to any of the consultations I did with them, and the uh, colonels came out later and said, we've never seen anything like this before. You did terrific. I mean, it just got everybody talking and we've never been able to get that to go before. Mm -hmm. John? I would say uh, there are certain environments that make it easy for brains to acquire new information. And one of them is feeling safe and relaxed and, and having fun or playing helps people feel safe and relaxed and, and avoids the fight or flight response. We'll, we'll probably do a whole second hour on just brain chemicals and how they affect learning. But it's really important, especially to build um, the brain chemical oxytocin, which is the trust chemical, for the learners to trust the teacher. And one way you do that is by having fun and laughing together. And mm -hmm. so uh, fun is super important in education. So just to let you know, at the beginning, when children come to our center for the very first time, so they're junior kindergarten, they're three and a half, four-year-olds, we actually do a home visit. Uh, it was one of the things that we discussed and we thought that was really important. We would visit their home to understand who that child was, what kind of toys they played with, who they were. So our first job was to establish that relationship. So when they came into the classroom, they already knew us. They walked in through the, you know, and our first classroom was a house. We had a, it's called Ring House 3, and we had a you know, on campus. And that was the first school that they came into. So they knew us, they had met us at, at their home, they came into our classroom, and then we started talking to them already, we, we had an understanding of who they were, and, uh, you know, what their personalities were. And often, kids would say themselves once they got to know each other, go talk to Carl about this. So do go talk to Veronica about this, because they knew that Veronica was an organizer, Carl was, you know, uh, technically amazing. And so People, children already started to learn that they, that each of those children's lived experience meant something and they could go to them for more help. Um, yeah, so that was the fun part, the early starch, the setting the tone in the classroom, as I call it, um, is to build that relationship. But once you have that, then any topic that comes up, you can be engaged in and you can be you can bring people in and, and the children know how to ask questions. We talk a lot about, so if we wanted to find out something, how do we do this? We are the voice in the back of the head saying, well, I wonder, I noticed when you said this, this happened. Do you think you need to say it this way? Uh, so we are helping them with the language as well and, you know, and our job is to scaffold, right, our children to towards whatever they want to learn. So that was fun for us. And, and then the other skills, like how do you negotiate? How do you problem solve something? I mean, something I grew up with was any problem on the table, there's 15 different ways to solve it. 
and in five different languages in my case. So, you know, so my dad made me learn Sanskrit when I was a little kid, even though it was a dead language, because he wanted me to read the Gita, the Bhagavad Gita. And so I grew up with this kind of thinking where everything is possible. And I think you share that with the children as well, that anything and everything is possible. You simply have to, if you don't know how to do it, there are people around you who know how to do it. And if you they don't know it, we'll go look for those people who can come and help us problem solve. So I think that kind of attitude is something that you just simply present in the classroom and you invite children to be part of it. Do, do you think we, a, I just want to say one thing. Did, did, yeah. did you, do you find uh, that we underestimate children about yes. what they're capable of when it comes to projects? Absolutely. I mean, you know, people who walk around saying, you know, blank slate, that doesn't work in our classroom. These children come with lived experience already. They already have a personality. They know what they want. If you if you talk to them, some of the shy ones, you've got to bring them out. Um, as I think someone mentioned um, um, there are children who are logical and rational, who you can give stuff to and they just run with it. And then there are children who need help. With the, the scaffolding, as I call it. So one of the things we teach them is how do you plan your day? How do you and be strategic about it? If you want to get here at the end of the day, what is it that you have to do to get there? So help them understand what that process is. And then the more they do it, the, the their lived experience grows. And the second project, they're experts. They know what to do. They know how to go out and ask for questions, ask questions and get answers and uh, and, you know, engage in the in the learning that they want to do. So it's it's really about those skill sets, just teaching them within context. It makes sense. You don't teach it as an outside thing, but, you know, I need to work in the woodworking area. Well, what are the rules around it? There are rules around working next to each other. How do we talk to each other? Uh, you know, there are ways to resolve conflicts. You want the same tool. Well, that's not going to work. So how are you going to negotiate? Are you going to put a little plan up on the wall and everybody signs up and says, OK, I, I'm going to get it for 10 minutes and you're going to get it the next 10 minutes? Well, negotiate, figure that out. Um, but safely. Right. I mean, someone mentioned safety and I think that's really important. We'll hear from one of our own problem solvers, Josh. <laughs> um, hopefully I'm not causing more problems than I'm solving. Um, yeah, yeah, you did touch on it actually, Sean, too. I wanted to ask you more on the play aspect as your original comment focused more on the, the focus end of it. But what I've noticed in your comments is that you, um, I want to ask you about the play and the, but you, you actually mentioned about role playing. Mm -hmm. I noticed a couple of your tools have been role playing and you answered one of my questions just now in that how they're able to negotiate who's, who has what roles. Mm -hmm. Um, is there any guidelines that you use for 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 using role playing? It's I think it's a, a pretty interesting strategy, but I wonder how you implement it. Um, I mean, role playing comes from the relationships that we have. We understand each other, and we know someone is better or good. You know, like wh whatever we perceive that to be, and and often we simply make the assumption as well that the children will do this. They're able, they're, they're capable of doing something. Uh, so then we sort of, you know, just it's part of the conversation that we have. And then sometimes children can't see that something is happening in front of them, that they are, when they serve certain, you know, so when they talk a certain way to someone, they may be offending someone and they don't understand that. So really our job is to do that bit of scaffolding, helping them to take on that piece. Um, and the role playing is a safe way to kind of try things, you know, and, and do things and uh, uh, move things forward. Uh, sometimes we might even say, would you like, like if we have a clinic, who would like to be the doctor here? And then take turns. Right. Who's going to be the nurse? Who's going to be the receptionist? And there's always children who step forward. And then you the ones who are not sure, um, then you invite them again to take those roles on later. They, they see how it's done and they go, hmm, that's not too bad. I know how to be a doctor. It's a good thing. Stethoscope, who doesn't want to use one of those things and listen to the heart? So it's it, you make it fun and then eventually they will take it on and they will use it. Um, yeah. It's it's fun. It's it's lots of fun to be able to engage like this with children. Thank you. And Mark. So I think it's really interesting that in the project approach, um, it is a way of uh, getting to questions that you don't necessarily get to when you have the lecture approach. Because mm -hmm. from my own experience, in the lecture approach, at the end of the appro at the end of the lecture, someone will say, "Are there any questions?" Mm -hmm. And very few people raise their hand because I understand everything that came out of the person giving the lecture's mouth. 
But it's not until I sit down and actually try to put those work, put that workflow to a test that the questions come out. And so it must be difficult to try and sell this approach to administrators when in fact it is such a powerful approach because it's not until the actual workflow that the questions are arise. So mm-hmm. how do you how do you how do you use that, you know, how how do you sell that to the administration above you that you're trying to use this type of educational approach? Well, I think one of the ways you do it is you have to understand the curriculum really well. If you're a grade three teacher, understand everything that you have to do for these children at this age, particular age um, that you have to do. If you understand it, then you can explain how it's being constructed in your classroom through a project that we're that you're doing. So I think it's that understanding. So much of our planning time, you know, we have these planning meetings where we all get together and talk about what's happening in our classrooms. We actually share what's happening within the, and again, it's important to use the language, the the curricular language with the administrators. So they understand, you understand this. You understand that at the end of the year, all of these children are going to walk out knowing how to do fractions, as, as someone said, or how to do multiplication tables or whatever it was that is important to administrators because they want you to make sure the curriculum works that, you know, in their classroom. But you're saying, I mean, and w- what we are saying in a, in a project classroom is that there are ways to weave this in. And here's how we did it. Here's how we assess those children. And by the way, the children can assess themselves too. I mean, we often invite children to say, how well did you do this? Did you understand this? Is this something, you know, if there's something very specific, you need them to understand, you ask them the question. You could, you could, it's, it's in, in a part of the conversation. You ask them, do you understand what this means? Uh, you know, do we, how do we share this knowledge? And I think that's when you do the representations, when you, when you ask children to represent something that they've learned in the way that they want to share, whether it's, like I said, different areas, writer as a writer or as a as a you know po- someone who wants to write poetry or in the woodworking, you share it. But then the labels are there, the language is there. You still have to write a piece of writing that goes with your work, um, so you still know how to present your information. It could be a poster, it could be, as I said, you know. Um, um, a piece of writing that you want someone to have. Um, so there's lots of ways that you can weave this curriculum through. Um, but I think you have to be really aware as a teacher, you have to be aware of what the curriculum is. I uh, can relate a small story, which I'm sure Shantu's never heard. But uh, as a parent uh, of attending the school with other parents on a sort of presentation day or celebration, one of the other parents came up to my wife and said, they're not learning anything. They're just playing. <laughs> and my wife said, no, they're learning. And they go, well, they're not learning math for one thing. And then she said, no, have you seen how they're measuring stuff and how they're calculating and they're helping each other solve it? No, I didn't notice that. Have you seen how they're writing everything down or drawing and doing? Well, yeah, I saw that. Well, they're all learning those things just in a different way. They're not just learning about what it is or hearing about what they should learn. They're actually doing things and then not even aware that they're learning all these things. Uh, we'll finish with Alex on this question. Yeah, and one of the things about learning that I think about a lot is the fact that people aren't ready for the answers until they have the questions. <laughs> you know, so, and I think of it a lot of times is that they're like a, a, a slab and if you pull it open by, with stress, you, you show all the little holes and now they're ready to put something into them, <laughs> but they weren't ready when it was closed until they were stretched out to, to think about those. They weren't ready to do those things. And, um, you know, one of the things is, as I taught, I taught a lot of visual effects and media production is that, you know, I had a list of what I need to cover and I had examples and I had process of what I'm going to show people but I just waited for the question for a whole se- for a whole semester for that, you know, and so when we got into, I don't understand why my, the edges of my green screen are too hard. I had a 10 minute answer with illustrations and process. Now I could have given them that at the very beginning, but they wouldn't have heard, remembered any of it. But once they've all done a bunch of this and someone, <laughs> so, someone unsuspectingly asked the question, I had a big presentation and anyone I didn't have, that was the next year or the next season that I did that class, I had that illustration, you know, and so I just slowly built these illustrations up. So I had a, and I still use them here. I mean, the ones that are 15 years old, some people have seen me pop them up because it took a lot of work to do the first time. I want to do it again. So, so, I mean, we we would shoot extra footage and everything else to do that. So, you know, I think that that it's so important that we have um, 
uh, that we, you know, kind of prepare for that and, and just give them the information as they work. One of the things that we did with a, with a magnet school uh, is that not a magnet school, but a charter school and that isn't around anymore, but we did it. We had all the students in the high school. Um, they were tasked with supporting all of the different departments for, for doing visuals. So whether it was stills or animations or whatever, and they would, we would give each section, in this case, we gave them each a million, quote unquote, a million dollars. And then the students had to quote the money, like this, this animation is going to cost $46,000 and, you know, or whatever it is. And they'd work with all of them. This is part, this is their class. And the students at the end of the year, so they had learned more about more things than they'd ever, because they were building animations and they had to figure out how to, how to, they'd have to go back to the teacher and go, well, how does that actually work? Or what does this actually look like? Or what, and they, and they learned more about math, more about physics, more about biology, by just having to build little animations about it. And it was, it was really good. I wish the school had survived, but, but the, the, the program was good for a couple of years. Awesome. Uh, I just want to make a comment that one of the things we did for parents when did parents did come to us and say, is there something going on? Like, why, why aren't we seeing the piece of learning? Uh, things, especially for literacy, like when we, you know, we accept so much approximation from kids when they're talking and so on, but for reading, we want them to do it right away. So we had um, Dr. Margaret Brooks, who was the lead teacher at the time, uh, and I, we did a workshop for parents where we invited them in and we presented a language that they, you know, uh, English letters, but a completely new um, uh, language. And they had to read and they had to write. And at the end of the class, end of the day, they had to be able to write their name and so on. So they understood how, what the process, what the brain was going through when they tried to learn something new. Uh, so the more reading we know uh, in terms of, you know, um, whole language learning that you have to read with children, you have to actually present the books and they, you have to, you know, track with your finger the letters so they understand these sounds go with these letters and uh, so things like that so we would actually have parents in the classroom um just parents and just do workshops with them to see show them how we were um what was happening in the classroom that where really the learning is, where the learning is happening yes yes where yeah. the learning is happening it's important to a couple more questions here next up Next question is from Hershey Trevetti from Daytona Beach, Florida. I'm noticing an underlying theme with the project approach. Would you agree that it's more practical workflows versus other approaches? It's definitely practical. Um, it's hands-on. It's it's inquiry based. It's you know it comes from uh, a combination of children's interests and our interests, and and together we're moving forward on um, learning a particular real world topic. Um, and it's fun and engaging for us because we are not just sitting in front of a classroom listening to someone talk, right? So I think that definitely with the younger children, especially, that's important to weave the curriculum through. Um, I think children are, you know, they disengage if it's not interesting. So it's important to keep that going. For sure. And John? Yeah, I think I would agree. I think it, it naturally lends itself to practical workflows in ways that other approaches don't, uh, specifically in K-12 education. I know that in, in corporate training, you are you are practically oriented, but we don't generally use the project approach. I think it's fair also to say that it's, um, and this is for those of you who are not educators, uh, some terminology, it's a form of constructivist education. And the idea there is the learner builds the knowledge in their brain uh, rather than passively, passively observing or absorbing it. And so it's the learner has to put effort into making those connections specifically by connecting new information to old information, uh, which does naturally become a, a more practical type of education. Absolutely. Yeah. Okay, another question from Douglas. Yeah, Douglas Carmichael asks, how do you gauge how engaged students are with a particular project in a project approach learning environment? This comes mm -hmm. to the evaluation question, doesn't it? Yeah. yeah, well, they're working very hard at it, for sure. They come back to us and ask more questions. The questions, you know, have more questions and, and it just keeps going. Um, the assessment part is um, inviting, um, well, as educators, as I said, we gave ourselves time to observe children as well. So we would step back from teaching, uh, especially when we had you know, two or three people in a classroom, you can do that. You can sort of step back every day and observe a child or two. Uh, so that by the time, you know, uh, these uh, halfway through the semester, you have a real understanding of your classroom and what, uh, what the children are about and what they're engaged in. So definitely the assessment part is that 
piece where we observed. And you have to remember, this was a lab school. So we had observation rooms as well. So sometimes we would have 15, 60, sometimes students observing us in the classroom. We had cameras in the classroom where we could go up on the top of the floor there, second story, and parents and psychologists and you know whoever else, whatever they were there to do, they could observe the classroom. And we were the facilitators. And then later at the end of that session, we would come up and we would discuss what they saw. And uh, so, you know, students, for instance, would say to me or say to us, uh, I, I'm here to look at active listening. So where did where did you say that? Or sometimes they would say to me, um, uh, you're supposed to be integrating children with challenges. I didn't see anyone. And I go, great. That means integration is working. So it's, it's really those kinds of conversations where we assume certain things to be happening. And it's not. It's it's already been integrated and the children are scaffolding each other and we are scaffolding the kids. So. That's great. Do the panel have any more comments or uh, questions? Because uh, we're nearly at the top of the hour here. None? Okay. Well, uh, for those viewing us uh, from afar, uh, you can find out more about the Project Approach by visiting Duke Schools Educators Institute. This brings uh, educators from around the world together to learn more about project-based learning and innovation. Uh, these people welcome preschool, elementary, and middle school teachers, curriculum specialists, and school administrators to come and learn more. They have tours, and they do consulting and have project work samples on their website. The website is www.theeducatorsinstitute, all one word, dot org. I'd like to thank Shen Tu for accepting our invitation, and I'd like to thank our panelists for their insight and comments. And of course, our viewers and the producers who submitted questions for us to ponder. Uh, we could not do this without the many volunteers behind the curtains uh, who operate the systems which bring you this experience. I hope you've seen something which makes you want to explore more. Perhaps we'll see you next time. Bye for now. Bye for now. That was great. For someone who was half asleep, I think you did very well. Thank, Thank you, you so much for joining us. Yes, I'm going back to bed now. <laughs> <laughs> Smart people go back to bed after they wake. We, we, we don't call oh, yeah. going back to bed. We call it napping. We're gonna take a nap. Oh, mm, okay. I'm just gonna go down a little nap. That <laughs> nap might last a couple of hours, That's but. You You're not familiar with the closing thing, but we uh, whisper during the oh, It's fine. It's fine. Yeah, right. I think I've woken everybody up here, so no. <laughs> I have a little project by my eyelids. I'd like to like to look into. I'm gonna go think about it for a little while and close my eyes and quote unquote meditate on it. Let's see. And awesome. I'm, sometimes I snore while I'm meditating. So. <laughs> okay. All right. So All right. Thanks. Thanks. Thanks so much. Thanks for having really me. Enjoyed it. We'll see yes. you next time. Oh, another we'll time. Talk to you again, I'm sure. All Bye right. for now. Thanks, all guys. No